Yeah, all good. Can everyone hear me and can everyone hear Ken? Can someone, can you show a sign, like wave your hands around like this? Um, good. Okay, let's, um, before we start this session of uh, In Conservation With, and this is quite a young series of, uh, of interviews that I've started actually only a week ago. And already, you know, we've had some really fascinating people and I can't have a more fascinating person as far as I'm concerned than Ken Kaufman. But before we actually talk with Ken, I just want to make sure, firstly, in terms of housekeeping, that we all um, mute our mics um, until, you know, you want to ask a question. And also, if you could, if you want to ask a question at any stage, because, you know, this is a conversation as well that includes all you guys, then you can, if you're not familiar with Zoom, you can go to the participants button and I think apparently on top of there you've got a thing where you can just wave a hand like that and we will come straight over to you and ask you a question, uh, get you to ask a question. So that's um, one thing you could do. And if you've got an iPad or some sort of tablet, apparently on the right hand side is a series of dots in the corner. And if you click that, that will allow you to do your hand wave as well. So if you wish to ask questions, please feel free at any point. Um, and the other thing is, um, today's proceedings are being recorded and uh, I hope that everyone's happy with that. And if you are wanted by the police, please turn your camera off now. Okay, great. Now, here we are. This is uh, In Conservation With. I'm with, for me, a, a great hero of mine. And I don't, I'm not sure which way to point, but the point both ways. Ken Kaufman, um, a man that I... Um, as a young man sort of heard about in the UK and I thought wow this guy has done so much and I'd love to meet him and I never thought I would meet him until about seven years ago I think it was Ken wasn't it yeah about seven years ago I went to the Rio Grande Festival Rio Grande Valley Festival that's and, right yeah the RGV <laughs> yeah and uh and basically I met Ken then and it was like an amazing moment I met Ken actually with the same time as I met David Sibley and we had a photograph together and I had the great pleasure of spending um, a couple of weeks in February with Ken in, in Colombia because we were both um, there to celebrate and be uh, participate in the Columbia Bird Fair and I got to know Ken and his wonderful wife Kimberly so it was amazing to do that. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with Ken, I, I could, I've got some notes on him. I, I could, <laughs> could talk about Ken in terms of the notes I've got for the next hour, but... Um, <laughs> Let's not do that. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Let's not do that. <laughs> well, I'll, I will try and surmise as much as possible. Um, Ken is an American author. He's an artist, a naturalist, and a, conser a conservationist. He's also the field editor of Audubon magazine, and that's a fantastic publication. He's also husband to the delightful Kimberly, and he's an international tour leader. So he covers the whole gambit as far as I'm concerned. The stuff he does is the stuff of dreams in terms of what people would love to do in, in, this, in this industry. Um, I'm gonna start at the beginning, and we're gonna just talk through um, stuff, if that's okay with everyone. Um, the first thing I, I want to say is that, you know, Ken started birding at the age of six. So what, what happened? Was there some epith epiphany or was there, was there a spark situation? How did that all happen? For me, it was, it was really just luck. My, uh, I didn't know anyone who was interested in birds or nature, but my parents liked books. And so there were always a lot of books around and I became fascinated with pictures of big animals, you know, tigers and elephants and things. But we were living in the Midwest in the US and we didn't have those things around. So uh, when I was about six years old, I decided I would take a day or two to figure out these birds out in the yard. And I've been working at that ever since. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I had no spectacular spark bird, you know, nothing like Roger Peterson and his flicker bursting up from the ground with a glorious burst of golden wings or anything like that. For me, it was more like, you know, starlings and grackles. Wow. 
Um, what I love about your the next stage of your story, I mean, in terms of what's documented anyway, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of things happen between the age of six and 16, but um, am I wrong in saying that at 16, you dropped out of high school uh, to hitchhike across America to go birding? I mean, that's, that is amazing. <laughs> That's right. And I, you know, I, when I have a chance to talk to young people, I say, you know, things are different now. This, we're not in the 1970s. And if I were in school now, I would stay there. But I decided, you know, at the age of 16, I was doing well in school, but the subject about which I knew the most was birds. And I had taught myself all that. So I figured self-education could work. So I decided to just go out and uh, hitchhike around North America looking for birds and uh, kept that up off and on for about the next five years. So the question is, um, at the age of 16, um, were people saying to you, what the hell are you doing? Or did you just oh, yeah. go off and do it? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, they've been saying that ever since too. But I, <laughs> yeah, no, my, uh, uh, a lot of people thought that I was just uh, throwing my future away. And um, my parents were very unusual people and, um, uh, pretty amazing. Even though they both had college degrees, they, they gave me their their blessing to go out and travel and, and try to learn that way. And they got lots of criticism from other people, you know, from relatives and neighbors saying that it was a terrible mistake. And so once I started to succeed at some things, you know, writing books and stuff, my parents would quietly photocopy news stories and send them to all the people who had criticized them in the past. <laughs> and when you set off, I mean, I, I just want to try and imagine what was going through your mind as a 16 year old kid, basically. You walked out of your front door, where did you go first? And what was your knowledge like then? Did you actually have a good working knowledge of birds of, of the birds of North America? I, no, I really wasn't. Um, I wasn't a very skilled birder at that point. I thought I was, um, but that was because I, you know, I hadn't really had a chance to interact with any top-notch uh, experts at that time. I'd met some very kind people, uh, members of the local Audubon chapter in Wichita, Kansas, who they were kind enough to take me along on field trips and things. And they were, they were great people and they knew more than I did. But once I got out and started running around, I ran into some really amazing birders, um, like uh, the late Ted, Ted Parker. Um, Mark Robbins, who were you know roughly my age, but so much more skilled, and so I suddenly uh, suddenly had to step up my game. It was it was quite educational. So I guess you didn't have a lot of money in your pocket. Did you just basically sort of rough it in and just took the chance? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I know. I had I had worked as a counselor at a summer camp. The when I was uh, 16 in June and July. So then in August, I, I had a few bucks and I took off for Arizona. And, and it was great, you know, it was spectacular. <laughs> you know, living in Kansas, Kansas has wonderful birding. I have to say that. There are a lot of birds in Kansas, but once you head out toward Arizona and get close to the Mexican border, there are so many amazing exotic birds there that I, I was just completely captivated by that. And I just wanted to, just keep going forever, just going to different spots. And you hitchhiked the whole way, because apparently, um, according to Wikipedia, um, you covered over 80,000 miles, apparently. Is that right? That was just in 1973. Um, you covered 80,000 in one year. Yeah, that was the year that I turned 19, and I did, I did the most traveling that year because I was, I was attempting a big year. Okay. Um, but you know, overall, I probably hitchhiked you know well over two hundred thousand miles during that time. During okay. during for like a five year period. So speaking about your big year, you were what nineteen at the time? Is that right? Ran up to yeah, I turned nineteen that that year. Yeah, you 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 actually saw the most amount of birds um, during that year. That you actually got the biggest amount of six hundred seventy one species. Is that excuse my ignorance? Because obviously I live in. England, stroke Spain, stroke wherever else. But um, has that been beaten since? Oh yeah, many, many times. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, now regularly, uh, the big thing now is for people to, um, not even to try to break a record, but just for their own personal goal is to, to have more than 700 species in a year. But in the 1970s, it was a big deal. The, the record had been, um, 
598, uh, which was held by Stuart Keith for many years. You know, wonderful, wonderful guy, um, British, uh, living in the States, um, uh, expert on African birds. But in, in the late 1950s, uh, he did a trip around North America and saw 598 species. And that record held until 1971, uh, when Ted Parker broke 600. So in 1973, getting up to you know over 650 was a big deal. And when you did your big year and you got the 671 species, what were some of the highlights? What were the species that you didn't expect to see? Well, the highlights, the highlights were really the experiences. I just the you know, at the beginning of the year, I was really rapidly focused on my list. And by the end of the year, I didn't care that much about the list total. It was just, they, it was sort of swept away by just the whole experience. And being in places like being at, at the village of Gamble on St. Lawrence Island in Alaska, closer to the mainland of Siberia than to the mainland of Alaska, and being able to look off toward the west. And there are these shining cliffs up there on the horizon. And that's, that's Russia over there. And there are thousands and thousands of seabirds streaming past, all these uh, auklets and puffins and murres and kittiwakes, eiders, just all these birds streaming past. It's like, yeah, you know, I only saw a few new birds for the year there, but it was, it was just such an experience. Um, it, was, it was just, um, you know, it was really a life-changing uh, experience. And the, the number of species for the year was really the least important thing about it. Wow. Well, I suppose because of all that traveling, the uh, hitchhiking and stuff, you, uh, you sat down and wrote something and you wrote a cult classic, didn't you? King, King Bird Highway, which is a book that is still out there on sale now. And I'm sure many of us have actually read it. What was that like to write? Well, it was a slow process. I, um, it, it, came to me during 1973 while I was doing my trip that I was having a fairly unusual experience and that I should write something about it. So I, I wrote the rough draft in 1974 and 1975 and the original draft was terrible. It was absolutely dreadful. Um, and fortunately, I was able to recognize that it was dreadful. And I was so depressed that I just threw it in a box and left it there for years. Um, I didn't dig it out and start messing with it again until about 1990. Um, and then rewrote it like three times. And then my editor at Houghton Mifflin, Harry Foster, uh, took a look at it and went through the entire thing with red ink. And it was just a sea of red ink, with all these corrections and, and said, you know, you really need to do this over again. So I rewrote it again and eventually, so it was published in, in 1997. Uh, so 23 years after I started writing it. Wow. It's <laughs> incredible. Um, so, I, yeah, it was, um, you know, the original draft was four times as long as what was finally published, and it was really, really dreadful. But um, uh, Harry Foster really gave me an education uh, in writing, just in his edits on my, my terrible draft. Um, basically, you did all that traveling around. Is it out of your system now? Do you, well, do you feel the urge to go off running off to Alaska again? And uh... Well, right now I'd love to uh, run up to Lake Erie, which is about six miles from here. Uh, but we're, we're very much uh, just staying at home in the, uh, in, in the current climate. Um, but no, if uh, once things return to a state where we can travel, um, I definitely, um, I definitely like to travel some every year. Um, it's, um, it starts to get to me if I find that I've been in the same spot for months. I really love to get to the tropics and would hope to get to the tropics at least once every year. In the US, we've obviously seen a lot of species. I just want to get the birdie things out of the way because it's in my okay. head. Um, What's left for you to see in terms of the U.S. list? Whiskered auklet. What, you haven't seen <laughs> Whiskered auklet, yeah, basically that's it. I, I mean, there, there are vagrants that wander in from elsewhere, but of the, uh, 
you know, of the of the breeding species. Uh, well, also now Kasha crossbill. Uh, there's a, a species of crossbill uh, just found in one county of southern Idaho. It was just officially split a couple of years ago, and I have not seen that. So, you know, with the lumping and splitting, that creates new possibilities. But for things that we've known about for a long time, whiskered auklet out on the Aleutians, um, we, uh, and I have to go see that at some point. Uh, Kimberly has been urging me to set up some trip for us to go make an expedition to see the whiskered auklet and then write a book about it. And was there, was there like in the UK, um, we have situations where we have bogey birds. Like for example, for me, my bogey bird for, for many, many years was the common quail. I used to hear them, they've got a very distinctive uh, song, which is uh, written down often as, wet my lips, wet my lips. And mm -hmm. I used to hear it practically every summer in Norfolk, never saw one. One time I was actually in Poland, I was about this far away from one in grass Ooh. that high and I still couldn't see Ooh. it. And then one day out of the blue, I was in um, Israel, as, as I happened to be there, and uh, I was in the desert and someone kicked something and then someone else saw, heard <laughs> someone fly and I looked and it was a quail. And then ever since then I've been seeing quails. So uh, have, you, uh, have you a bogey bird? Within North America, I guess um, I guess my number one candidate would be fork-tailed flycatcher. It's a vagrant here, but it's annual, and there's a long history. I mean, John James Audubon saw fork-tailed flycatcher um, in Kentucky. You know, there were not that many birders uh, in the U.S. 200 years ago, but he saw fork-tailed flycatcher. They're reported every year, but I refuse to go chase a uh, stake out of one. I want to find my own. So you know, I've seen plenty of Fork-tailed flycatchers in in the American tropics, but I still want to find one uh, within the limits of the U.S. Ken, I can so identify with that because I had the same situation with Sabine's girl. I oh. I swore blind I'd never twitch one, and in the end, I actually found one in Chile of all places. Um, right. Do you? <laughs> I'll ask you a question about your belief. Do you believe? Do you believe, Ken? Do you believe that the Eskimo curlew and the ivory bill woodpecker exist? That's one where my heart says they still exist, but my brain says they do not, that they're gone. It's one of those, I, I have an internal conflict about that. Rationally, I can see no evidence at all that those two species are still with us. But in my heart, I still want to believe that it's possible and that someday, you know, I wouldn't even have to see it myself. If I knew that those birds were still on Earth, uh, that would make me happy. I'm planning one day to do, uh, to travel from the Canadian tundra, where they used to breed Eskimo curlews, mm -hmm follow their route into the Great Plains, probably walking amongst a big cornfield or something now, and then going across the, uh, the bay, uh, the Gulf of Mexico into the Pampas. Would you come with me if I planned that trip? Sure. Yeah, it would be, it would be a great, uh, great search. You know, I don't think we'll see the curlew, but it would be fun to look for it. <laughs> <laughs> so after your, you know, wandering around, you subsequently focused on, on working on, on bird guides. When did you actually make that kind of transition from, from sort of someone who's out there seeking all these birds to someone who now has become, or then decided to become an educator? Well, actually, um, you know, I, I started, I was leading tours. I was making my living by leading bird tours in the 1980s. And but at the same time, I started working on a book. Uh, it was the Field Guide to Advanced Birding in the Peterson series. And I started working on that in 1982. It wasn't published until 1990. Um, but the, with, with advanced birding, the idea was, was we just took like 35 groups of really difficult to identify birds and went into a lot of detail on those and just ignored um, all the other species in North America. So it was, a, it was like a supplement to, to basic field guides, like more than you ever wanted to know about Impidonax flycatchers, for example. Um, but that was, um, 
I'd, I'd, I'd felt all along I wanted to get into to writing and I, I hadn't thought about doing um, like a basic field guide um, until 1990, the year that my advanced birding came out. That was the same year that Roger Peterson's uh, a revised edition of his Western field guide was published. And I was actually talking to him that summer, summer of 1990. And, and he was in this very contemplative mood and he was looking at his new Western field guide and saying that he thought perhaps he had made it a little too complicated, that it wasn't as beginner friendly as he had intended originally. And he wondered if maybe he had been pressured by all the hotshot birders who were writing reviews of his earlier guides. And of course that made me feel really guilty because I was one of those people who wrote a critical review of Peterson's 1980 revision of his Eastern guide. I was somewhat critical because I felt like it didn't include all these real, these new detailed field marks we discovered for things like Thayer's Gall, which doesn't really exist. And so, <laughs> So because of this criticism, Peterson said, well, maybe he'd put too much detail into this uh, Western guide. So at that point, I started thinking, what would I do? If I were trying to write a field guide just for people who are just getting into it, like I was when I was six years old, when I didn't know any other birders, and I was having to figure things out from books, what would I put into that? So that was why I wound up doing the, uh, my, my first North American bird guide which came out in the year 2000. Uh, it was just the whole point was to make it, to make the first step as easy as possible. You are an accomplished artist, if I may say so. When did you discover that you could actually, you know, draw birds and paint birds? Well, I don't know. I, uh, I, I experimented with, with, drawing, <clears throat> with drawing and painting when I was a kid, I was, I was doing, drawings of birds and sketches when I was six or seven years old and uh, did quite a lot of it um, off and on in the 80s and 90s. I actually put the artwork aside when I started working on the field guides because uh, those are all illustrated with uh, with digitally digitally edited photographs. Um, so I, you know, I've spent thousands of hours in front of the computer editing all these photos for the for the color plates and the guides. Um, and I really didn't do much painting for a few years, but um, I got back into drawing and painting in a big way, um, I guess about seven, seven years ago. Um, Kimberly and I moved from a smaller house in the town of Oak Harbor out to this sort of rambling farmhouse with a huge garage. And so I took over half the garage and I've got my uh, drafting table out there and I've always got drawings and paintings in various degrees of being finished. Right. Oh. Now, I've watched you bird, and it's interesting. And likewise, likewise, I have watched you bird, <laughs> I'm happy to say. <laughs> That's interesting when you watch people bird because people have different ways of doing it. I mean, I've, I've noticed, especially you know, since I was a kid, but some people, um, they just have, sort of a tunnel vision i don't really see anything above that's why i'm all you know i've always thought to look up because people mm -hmm. don't see things above their heads and i think when i watched you because I, I had the pleasure of hanging out with you in colombia and i noticed that you um you seem to kind of you, you you're quiet but then something catches your attention your head turns and then i, I look again and you've walked off and there's no one else with you you seem to have this kind of sixth sense to, to find birds. And I, I just wondered, it's, it's an interesting question, I think, to ask people, what, what does it mean to you? What does birding mean to you? What, how do you feel when you go birding? Is it, is it a case of just going out and just, oh, I've seen this today, great. Or do you get something more sort of spiritually from this? Well, for me, it's it's very much a spiritual thing, and I think I think you probably understand that. Um, I I would say that you're a very spiritual birder. That for you, it's not just um, it's never just a check mark on a list for you. And I I feel like you um, you feel a connection to those birds. Like there's there's more going on 
than just a, just a dry scientific thing of saying, oh, okay, well, there's this bird. Um, I, for me, there's an emotional aspect, there's a spiritual aspect. Um, and I'm always torn between wanting to spend more time looking at this one bird, spending the entire day maybe looking at this one bird versus going off to see what else is around and sort of know the whole landscape and say, okay, what are, what are all the birds that are within this, uh, within a perimeter here of, you know, within a mile of here, <laughs> what birds are here? What's, what's the total landscape? Of, of this this ecosystem and the birds that live here, and it's it's really tough, you know, d dividing the uh, attention between those. That's one of the reasons that I like to sketch is because when I'm drawing, I really have to focus on that one bird. You know, you can't you sort of have to tune out everything peripheral, and and focus and concentrate to draw this one bird. What do you when you okay when you're looking at a bird, what 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 do you see? Well, visually, visually, I try to see shapes and motions and personalities. Um, and, you know, feather patterns are an important part of what you see, but they're not the most important part. I, uh, you know, I mean, we've seen plenty of paintings of birds where every feather is there, but the bird is missing. You know, there's, there's no sense of the actual personality. Um, so it's sort of the shapes, the attitudes, the so on, things like, uh, like our American Robin here. It's, uh, I mean, you're familiar with the American Robin and, uh, the way they move, they're just so sudden and abrupt, you know, dash across the lawn, stop. They're just, they're like on high alert, uh, all the time when they're awake. And, and I love that the, the shapes they're in, the, st the stances and postures they take just have have such an amazing alertness to them. Um, I, I love looking at that kind of thing. Yeah, it's incredible. I've been to America many times. I, I kind of spent 13 years in a row when I used to work in advertising. I, I spent 13 years in a row going to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. spending sometimes up to three months at a time. And I got to know not only the birds, but the birders as well. And one thing I've always thought of American birders whenever I've been in America is the fact that they are always so welcoming. I've never had any issues ever. And I think particularly when I came to Ohio last year, it was like I, I came into a family and I became part of that family. And it was absolutely amazing to, to be in that kind of, to be in the bosom of, of all these birders. What do you think of the, the birding landscape in the U.S. today as compared to when you were, you know, 16 to 19, 20, whatever, traveling around? Well, I would hope that it would be a welcoming community. Um, I, I think it was, it was fairly open and welcoming even when I was uh, first traveling around in my late teens and early 20s. Um, the, I mean, it, it, it was hard for me to tell because I sort of showed up on the scene and set this birding record and, you know, I still didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing, but people thought I must be some kind of expert because I had this big list. You know, I really, I had to go back around and look at all those birds again and try to figure out how to identify them, you know, but, but so I, I tended to be welcomed into places where they might have been sort of uh, snooty or exclusionary um, if they thought I was a rank beginner. But I think there have been, um, you know, a number of uh, influential birders uh, in North America who have really pushed the idea of inclusion and bringing people in and saying, you know, birding is, is really for everyone. And I hope that that's uh, pervading the, the whole community here. And what do you think about the future of birding in the US? Um, I, actually, I actually think it's bright, just, just based on, on what I see. Uh, partly um, from talking with young birders organizations and uh, uh, 
it seems uh, the the younger brooders now it's they seem to be more diverse uh, it's more of an even mix of uh, boys and girls now um, look at yeah, some things that are that are measurable uh, Victor Emanuel started a, a thing called Camp Chiricahua back in 1985 it's a, a, a birding camp for teenagers and uh, he really had to go out and beat the bushes back then even to find any any teenage birders to attend and for the first few years, they were essentially all boys. But now more and more young women are getting into it. And so it's often like half and half. In the, uh, the Ohio Young Birders Club here, um, it started off with uh, three girls and three boys. And it's been pretty much an even mix ever since. And at the annual conferences, uh, there are lots of presentations by these young women. And, um, you know, just... The, the talent and intelligence that I see in the, the young birder community really makes me uh, optimistic for the future. And does that sort of also uh, pervade out into the ethnic um, area as well? Are there many Afro-American and other ethnicities being involved in this as well, or is it still predominantly white? It's still predominantly white, white too. An embarrassing degree, but there are signs of progress. We are, you know, seeing seeing more and more people of color uh, taking part in in birding, um, which is really a, really a welcome development. I mean, I think you're you're having a conversation tomorrow uh, with Jason Ward, I believe. Yes, uh, he's doing a lot. Um, Drew Lanham has done tremendous work here. Um, uh, our friend Doug Gray. Doug Gray over in Indianapolis is, is very influential. Uh, John Robinson, Dudley Edmondson, um, Tiffany, Tiffany Adams. Um, uh, Tiffany Adams is a, a young black woman from, she's now in the in Seattle area, but she was one of the keynote speakers at Biggest Week a couple of years ago. Uh, the Biggest Week in American Birding, I should identify it for uh, audiences, you know, for anyone who doesn't know. Um, so we're you know, it's it's, or it it is still the the burning community is strongly skewed toward, you know, just just white people. But we are seeing more and more diversity now, and it's um, that to me is one of the most exciting things that's uh, that's happened in recent years. Um, I really want the burning community in this country to look like the overall demographics of the country. Yeah. Um, you do a lot of work with the uh, Ohio Young Birders Club. I mean, I mean, I'd like to know more about what you do, but with them. But what what do you say to beginner birders in terms of you know to get them engaged and to get them to think, yeah, I can be involved in this. Well, it, part of it is just. Um just a matter of getting across the fact that just just conveying the uh, the fascination of um, you know the things that the things that birds can do and just the sheer variety that's out there and uh, just amazing facts. It's not about like developing like okay you have to see this many species or you have to be able to identify this flycatcher or anything. It's just like you know, this, this sandpiper here just flew here from Southern South America. It's got another 4,000 miles to go before it gets to its breeding grounds. It's just, you know, this thing is just navigating across continents and across oceans. And just, just look at this amazing thing and what it's doing. Just the, um, the amazement of what birds can do, uh, I think is compelling if you present it that way. And also the fact that birding is something that, that everyone can do however they like. It's not, it doesn't have to be done in a certain way. Uh, like there is no, as long as you're not actively hurting the birds or infringing on other people's rights, there's no wrong way to go birding. So if someone just wants to, you know, just focus on hawks and ignore everything else, or um, just stay in, stay in one spot and bird there, you know, that's fine. Uh, any approach is, is fine. Um, and it's not oh, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or not, but no, it's, it's, it's great to hear you speak. You know, so I'm I'm happy to you know to hear whatever you say. <laughs> but, 
But basically, the other thing is, I mean, it's not just birds with you, is it? You, 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 you're across the whole board, aren't you? you? You love natural history per se, don't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was, as a kid, I was just, just focused on birds and I refused to look at anything else until I was about 13. And then I started to become fascinated with insects. And then I saw that Roger Peterson had illustrated a field guide to wildflowers. I thought, well, I guess I need to figure out these stupid plants here. And then um, when I started spending time in Arizona, there were so many great reptiles there. You know, just there's so much to see. Yeah, everything. Um, I think if you're interested in natural history, um, there, there's no way you could ever be bored. Um, it would take hundreds and hundreds of lifetimes to even scratch the surface of all the variety out there. Um, we do it, you know, we'll have moth parties at our house. Uh, we'll <laughs> invite people over and put moth bait out on the tree trunks and put out some black lights and just see what, what insects and, you know, moths and other insects show up after dark. And there's just amazing diversity. We keep on, you know, at our, we've lived in the same house now for seven years and Every time we have lights on outside, we find some new species of moth, moth that we haven't seen before. Just that, you know, the, the variety is endless. Yeah, it's incredible. We live in a, an amazing world that we're rapidly destroying, unfortunately. Anyone out there would like to ask Mr. Corfman a question? Mr. Oates, Robert Oates also known as Robert Oates in England, but in, uh, in Colombia, it's Oates. Hello, sir. Good evening. Hello, David. Great pleasure to be joining in this video um, conference meeting. And uh, as you said, I had the great pleasure of uh, meeting Ken and spending some time birding with Ken and yourself at the Columbia Bird Fair in February. Uh, my question to Ken is, did he learn anything new about birds or birding while he was at the Columbia Bird Fair that he would like to share with us? Um, yeah, well, first, uh, good to see you, Robert. And uh, we've enjoyed your book immensely. It's, it's really wonderful. Um, so, uh, but as for learning things, um, uh, as for learning things while we were in um, in Colombia, I feel like I learn new things um, about birds every time I go outdoors. Um, I, I learn new things every day in in, um, in my backyard in Ohio. But the um, the thing that um, so I, I've been traveling to the American tropics for a long time. And to me, the most, the most wonderful thing about the Columbia trip was just seeing how many people there were getting into bird watching. You know, back in the, um, in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, if you wanted to know about Colombian birds, you talked to the, uh, the Americans or the Europeans who had been there. Uh, there was hardly anyone in the country studying birds, but now there's so many they're really great expert birders and ornithologists all over Colombia, all over so many other uh, Latin American countries. Uh, that you know, that to me is the most exciting thing. Um, they're and they're you know they're they're learning things that you know these casual visitors from uh, the North Temperate Zone never would have figured out. And it's it's a great thing for everyone uh, to have all this uh, birding activity and bird research going on there. What um, what kind of families of birds are you uh, most turn you on? I mean, for me, the ones that least turn me on are parrots and ducks. Even though I do like a I do like a duck, a good duck now and again, and parrot. But what birds families do you actually enjoy looking at? Well, um, <laughs> I, if I if I start to think about it, I can make a case for just about any group of birds I've ever seen. They're um, they're all uh, so fascinating. The ones I really like to draw are uh, birds of prey and big wading birds like herons or cranes. Um, just for the, the sheer excitement of watching them, I really love the shorebirds. You know, especially the long distance migrant shorebirds like golden plovers or uh, pectoral sandpipers or 
uh, white rump sandpipers that go from one end of the earth to the other uh, twice a year. Um, there, you can see it in their shapes. They're built for those long migrations. They're slender and elegant and have those long wingtips and they're just, just amazing uh, flying creatures. Um, so I, I love to watch them. Um, but if I start thinking about it, the flycatchers, most people hate flycatchers, uh, the new world flycatchers, because they're so hard to identify. But I, I love the challenge of when you, when you actually figure out the differences among these things, uh, they're, they're all amazing. They, and each of them has their own niche. Uh, so I, I, I don't know, I can't really narrow it down. Could you give us a quick masterclass in terms of how to identify a bird when you see it? What do you look at first? What kind of notes, mental notes do you make to come to a conclusion, i.e., you know, to its identity? Um, if I'm looking at something unknown, um, like if I go to a new, a new country or a new avifauna, uh, sort of in rapid succession, I'm looking at shape, uh, behavior, where it is in the habitat, um, approximate size, um, and then and trying to put it into a group, you know, right from the start, you're trying to figure out, okay, can I put this in a group? Is it a, is it a woodpecker? Is it a, um, you know, is it a tanager? Whatever that means. Um, uh, and then starting to zero in on on specific markings and things. So it's starting with the the overall shape and structure of the bird, and then zeroing in from that. Um, but just just looking intently and trying to take in as much as possible before I look away. You know, it's, it's so tempting if you see something new to like look at it and then pull out the the field guide or the app or whatever and, and look for a picture that matches, but uh, it's 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 a lot more useful to just focus as long as you can, take in as many details as you can. If it sticks around, try to do a little sketch or take some notes. Um, ask yourself, you know, what color are the eyes? Um, what color are the legs? What's the exact wing, wing pattern? Um, just just taking everything in. When you are in your native USA what percentage of birds you see even if it's just for a split second how what if you express it as a percentage how many birds how many, what percent would you say you could recognize on site well if it's um if it's a decent look you know if, if you know, if it's a speck out at the horizon, then, you know, the percentage goes way down. But with a decent look, um, you know, more than 99%. And uh, that's not, um, yeah, that, that, that's not bragging or anything. That's just, you know, I think any anyone, I mean, I've been birding for 60 years. And um, I've seen all these things enough times that, you know, with with the with the level of practice that I've had, I'd be embarrassed if I if I couldn't identify ninety nine percent of them on site. So I don't know if if I'm misunderstanding your question or. No, you got it totally. Okay. Anyone else with any questions? You're all very shy today. You must be bristling with questions, surely. <laughs> Oh, there's a hand raised. Oh, where, where? <laughs> Arrest. Uh, Claire Evans. Oh, Claire Evans. Hello. Oh, I can see your hand now. Sorry, I didn't even notice that. Claire. Okay. Um, hi. That's really interesting stuff, Ken. Thank you so much for this. I was just wondering, is um, Kimberly, does she share your love of birds or is she uh, long suffering and sort of goes along after you? Hmm. Oh, well. <laughs> Oh, thank you for that question. I mean, she's probably long suffering because she has to put up with me, but uh, she is amazing. I, uh, she's, um, st she started with uh, being a, back in the 1990s, monitoring bald eagle nests, and then got involved with bird banding, bird ringing, with the Black Song Bird Observatory, and then sort of 
rose through the ranks there, becoming their education director and then executive director. So now she's the director of a bird observatory and runs the largest birding festival in North America, the biggest week in American birding. And um, she's my uh, she's my favorite uh, birding partner and favorite person. And uh, I would say she's um, she is totally as as deeply dedicated to birds as I am. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm very lucky. She Claire is a wonderful woman. I, I hung out with her also in February in Columbia. And what struck me about Kimberly is her love. She has love for everyone and everything, especially for Ken. <laughs> but, that, but that's then, always helpful. It, it is, yeah. And I was pretty pleased that she did have love for Ken, a massive love for Ken. But no, she's a very dedicated person and I had a lot of respect for her. It's good to know. I noticed she's hiding on the call, so I'm not sure she'd pipe up if <laughs> she disagreed. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, we've got Betsy McCaskey here has a question. Hello, Betsy. Betsy. Oh, Actually, sorry. it's oh, Haley sorry. here. Hello. I oh, hi. To How are you doing? Hi, Mr. Ken. Hi. hi, it's good to see you. How are you doing? Good to see you too. I'm doing great. Been doing a lot of backyard birding. Yeah, I can imagine. But um, have you have you seen anything interesting? Any migrants showing up? Oh, we have a we have a, a brown thrasher in the yard, which is oh great. Been oh, great. Uh, I don't know if he's around anymore, unfortunately. But that was that was something. That's great. Oh, we haven't had a brown thrasher great. here yet. Uh, so what I wanted to bring up, um, I would, I've been really enjoying this. I'd love to hear um, you speak about how birding and education lead into conservation because that is one of the things that's really important to me that's right yeah that's thank right. you very much for that i uh, i suppose it's possible for someone to get into birding and if they do it at a superficial level, they might not care about conservation. But once you um, once you start learning about these birds, um, I know uh, for me, when I was uh, in my late teens, I got to see, for example, a bird called the dusky seaside sparrow, which at that point was already endangered, and it's now uh, extinct. And just realizing that, wait, here's this bird that. Uh, you know, I was able to just hitchhike uh, down to Florida and, and walk out into this marsh and see this bird and now it's gone. You know, what about future generations who won't get to see that? And so I think um, the, if, if you're a thoughtful person and you spend time watching birds, then you almost automatically become concerned about conservation. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged to know, you know, people like you, Kaylee, who, uh, um, I mean, you promote conservation uh, through your work with the Ohio Young Birders Club and through your contacts with other people. You're already promoting uh, conservation to your peers, and I think that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for being here. I've got a couple of questions that have been uh, typed in, which you may already see, um, Ken, but I'll read them out anyway. Ronique says, what destination outside of the US are you most excited to bird at? Since you have been birding at home, are there any new species that you've recently seen that are new to your area and you've never seen before? So there's two questions there for you. One's global, oh. one's, one's just around the corner. Okay, yeah, well, yeah, being, <laughs> having birded no place except our backyard uh, for the last month plus here, um, I'm definitely eager to go out and travel to different places. So the, the two places that appeal to me most right now are Madagascar and New Guinea. I have not been to either, and they're both uh, so distinctive. They both have so many um, unique groups of birds. 
that they would probably be uh, at the top of my list uh, right now. Um, I mean, I mean, Madagascar in particular is like a separate continent. Uh, it's it's like its own small continent with completely different set of living things. Um, I am concerned about um, what the what the coronavirus is going to do to Madagascar because it's a fairly poor country and the infrastructure may not be well set up for uh, dealing with um, uh, with a pandemic like this. Uh, I think it's really important for us to support um, organizations like the World Health Organization and uh, promote any kind of aid that we can get to countries like that. Um, as for um, in burning my yard, I haven't seen anything that was um, that was new to me in particular because <laughs> but we've seen some things that were new for the yard. So that's always good. Um, I uh, actually just today had uh, solitary sandpiper, which is uh, they're migrating through, and I could easily see solitary sandpiper if I drove to a spot five or six miles from here. But since I'm not going any place, it was a great thrill to have one show up in the yard. That's pretty good. Um, Jonathan's iPad. I'm sure that's not his name, but anyway, Jonathan iPad. Um, is asking, Ken, what in general is happening to North American bird populations? We here, I don't know where here is, for example, are we here? Sorry, we here as in we here. We hear, for example, about declines in wood warbler populations. And by the way, for those listening in England and Europe, wood warbler is not the wood warbler that we have. The wood warbler is, I presume, the generic name for the North American New World warblers that show in fact thin build buntings am i wrong okay well they're yeah kind of they're they're, they're kind of like thin build buntings you could say that but uh very colorful and active flitting about in trees eating insects um so the question is about what is happening to bird populations in general um there's been a lot of work on that and one of the problems is that it's so hard to get um, any kind of population estimates uh, for widespread birds on a continent this size. Um, a number of people have attempted to come up with, uh, with population trends for birds. And there's some, uh, um, The, 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 well, there was a study published last fall suggesting that the total population of birds in North America had dropped by 30% um, since 1970. Um, and I salute the fact that the people did this study, but the, um, their, the data are very sketchy. Um, basically, that, that figure they came up with, it was taking hundreds of estimates and multiplying them by hundreds, hundreds of other estimates. And so the results could be off by uh, a few billion. Um, but there's a general sense the bird populations are, are declining, and some birds more than others. Some are doing fine. At any given time, there are some species that are doing well that are increasing. Uh, some of our big birds of prey, uh, bald eagles, ospreys, peregrine falcons, are doing very well now. Uh, with the warblers, there are certainly declines in some species um, and then in some parts of their range. Uh, golden winged warbler, black throated blue warbler, uh, Canada warbler all show some declines. Um, some other species, they show sharp declines on the breeding bird survey. But that's partly because the breeding bird survey just samples the southern edge of their breeding range, uh, as with black pole warbler, for example. Uh, black pole warbler uh, numbers on the breeding bird survey have dropped sharply, but at uh, bird banding operations, the numbers really haven't fallen off. So it may be the black pole warbler populations are shifting north out of the areas in which they're counted. So this is a long way of saying, I don't know the answer to your question, but 
there are, there are specific reasons why uh, we don't know the answers. Uh, and it's certainly worth continuing to study. Ronique uh, has asked again, um, are you hopeful that North American bird species can be protected and their populations increase, especially given your current government? There are some serious uh, problems with the environmental policies of the current administration, but those environmental policies are not popular with the general public. So I'm optimistic that going forward, we'll have a return to some of the protections for wildlife that were in place up until like three years ago. Um, so I, I am optimistic that going forward, it will be possible to protect these populations. Um, they're, they're, there's, at the moment, there are hardly any North American bird species that are really seriously or desperately endangered. Uh, there are some that are declining that need attention, but there's nothing that's really on the brink right now. You know, if you if you discount some of these things like Eskimo curlew and ivory-billed woodpecker that that are probably gone, uh, of the birds we have now, um, there's nothing that's teetering on the brink. Um, so, um, you know, on on the continent itself, I think we can hold on to those things. Um, Right now, I'd like to see a lot of conservation dollars going into Hawaii, where there are some things that are really seriously endangered right now. Um, Robert Awates has asked, hi Ken, do you have any tips on how to observe migrants from our home or backyard while we are locked in at home? Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, for, for observing migrants during a lockdown, um, what we've been doing here is just going out and walking the yard really thoroughly uh, at least two or three times a day. Uh, early morning is a time when things are likely to show up. Um, so many, especially as we get toward the latter part of the spring, so many of the migrants are, are nocturnal. Um, so right at dawn, they're going to be shifting around uh, looking for a place to spend the day. And um, so frequently, if, if we're out, the earlier we can get out there, the more likely we are to, uh, to see something. Um, and of course, um, um, you know, we, we, keep, we keep detailed notes. I enter everything into eBird. Um, it's just an easy way to, um, you know, to keep track of things as I'm seeing them. But it also adds to the, um, um, the overall database. Let's see, Lois uh, Brunette has raised her hand. Hi. You see that? Hello. Hi, um, hi Ken. Hi. Uh, I wanted to, um, and hi, Claire, because Claire, you took me touring in, uh, around Brighton last year, which was so wonderful. Um, I wanted to let you know that we, I re remember me hearing you talk at um, the National Audubon Convention last year, and it was really great. And well, I, I got your book that, at that oh. time which you signed for me, which was great. And I had an interesting experience because I went on to New York and then flew back to LA a few days later. And the plane was flying over the parts that you were describing as I was reading them in the book. It was just, it was really surreal. I was reading about the, sand, the area right above Sandusky and the McGee Marsh and everything. And I looked out the window and there was that formation, that land formation was right there below my eyes. Wow. So that, that was really a really special moment. And I just find your writing to be so poetic such a beautiful evocation of really the mysteries of everything that's happening and how it's unfolding over time. And, and I just really, really appreciated reading this book and am much more in tune now in LA to what's happening in terms of migration, hard as the previous uh, uh, question you know, mentioned to do from home, but I did see a Nashville warbler and I'm in a condo in uh, oh, close to LA. So a Nashville warbler right in my yard. So <laughs> that, that made my day. But thank you for your beautiful writing and contributions. Well, thank you so much for that. I, I really appreciate it. You just made my whole week or month. And I, uh, that is so magical that you would have been reading about the area of, as the plane was flying over uh, uh, this, it, the edge of Lake Erie here. That's wonderful. It was, it was a very special moment and I have that area yet. But of course, after reading this book, that is very high on my list of destinations once we can get back on a plane. 
to be able to get up there. And I guess that's right now at this time of year. That's right. We're coming up on the on the peak here in like two or three weeks from now. But um, well, I hope that you'll come um, come visit us uh, in northern Ohio next year or whenever we have a year when we whenever can just we fully can. get out and enjoy the migration. I hope so. so thank too. you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Lars. Um, Claire actually has asked another question of you, Ken. Uh, she wants to know what kind of yard you have. Can you describe your yard? Um, sure. Um, it's not large. Um, it's a couple of acres and we're surrounded by farm fields. Um, we're in a rural part of, of northern Ohio. So surrounding us there are like fields that alternate year from year by uh, from either corn fields or soybean fields. Um, but the, we, there is a tiny pond uh, in the yard. Uh, there are a handful of trees, you know, maybe, maybe a dozen good sized trees. Um, and one of the best things about it is that when we moved in, it was this, this large mowed lawn and Kimberly and I made a decision to stop mowing big parts of it. And amazingly enough, we're just renting the house, but the, the owners of the house gave us permission to uh, leave big parts of this unmowed. Um, and Kimberly has brought in like various native prairie plants and put them out there. So we've got now this sort of brushy prairie. Um, and it's not, um, it's not extensive enough to really attract, um, um, you know, it's not like an entire habitat. It's not big enough. But one year, um, actually, meadowlarks nested in the side yard, and and eastern meadowlarks are not that common around here. So, um, just this, uh, it, it's it's a, um, it's really a wonderful place to be because we can look out over these farm fields and things fly past and things are dropped in. Um, things that are relatively rare for northern Ohio, like. Uh, like little gull and lesser black-backed gull and Harris's sparrow uh, have either flown by or have land, landed in the yard. That's fantastic. There's lots and lots, but yeah, Kimberly is a great gardener. She's uh, she's management, and I'm labor when it comes to uh, to the garden. But we we do have a lot of native prairie plants now. Hmm. Cool. Um, What's your experience in Europe? Do you, have you been birding in Europe much? I haven't been, I haven't spent a lot of time birding in Europe. Um, I, uh, I've, uh, well, I birded around Amsterdam several times when I was on my way to or from Africa, you know, because I was, I was flying KLM and so I'd spend a day birding around Amsterdam. Um, went to a meeting in the Netherlands a number of years ago on the island of Tessel. Um, uh, birded in uh, England for a couple of days <laughs> and <laughs> hope to do more sometime. Uh, spent uh, um, spent a couple of weeks in Sweden. Uh, Kingbird Highway was uh, translated into Swedish uh, by Lennart Nilsson and published in Swedish by Ellerströms. And so uh, Jonas Ellerström and Lennart Nilsson took Kimberly and me around Sweden for a couple of weeks. Uh, birding and I, I gave a couple of lectures but um that was wonderful and then uh, a couple of years ago um we spent uh, a week in uh, portugal and uh western spain we went from lisbon over into extremadura and uh, extremadura as you know david is one of the most wonderful places on earth and we're really hoping to get back there that's fantastic Okay, um, any more questions? Because it may, oh, Ronique says, what are some of your favorite books on birds, nonfiction or fiction that you've read? Um, tell you what, I'll name one. Uh, the Peregrine by J.A. Baker. Mm -hmm. Not, maybe not that many people know the book, uh -huh, but I guess David does, yeah. Yeah. Is that back to front? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that uh, it was published more than fifty years ago, but it's a uh, it's a classic that that really holds up. Um, if I were recommending one one bird book uh, today, that would be it. Great. Okay. Well, we've come to the sure. part of the evening where 
we kind of, I think, begin to wrap things up, actually. And I, um, oh, can you hear me? Oh, uh, yes, I can. Good, good. I was a bit worried then. Um, I have started this new tradition for this particular series of interviews, which I've kind of stolen from another series I used to watch on TV called <laughs> In the Actors Studio. And this guy who died recently, unfortunately, but he used to interview all the big, great actors like, you know, Robert De Niro and Jodie Foster and all these guys, talk to them about their careers in front of a studio audience um, of students, film students. And at the end of all that seriousness, he will then say, or will ask, what's your favorite curse word? And what would you say to <laughs> Peter when you, when you made it to the uh, pearly gates? Well, I'm not going to ask Ken those questions, but what, I will, right. do, <laughs> <laughs> what I will ask you is, Ken, what is your favorite bird? You know, this is an indication of the fact that I'm not very smart because people have been asking me for years what my favorite bird is, and I still have not ever come up with a good answer. So I have a different favorite bird every day. And today, my favorite bird is something called the black and chestnut eagle, which is, is found in the mountains in South America. It's a montane species of eagle that's really beautiful and magnificent, and I haven't seen one for a while, and I would like to go someplace where I could see that bird. Fantastic. What is your favorite fish? My favorite fish is the bluefin tuna, just because it's such an amazing migrant. Migrating, for example, from the Gulf of Mexico up into the North Atlantic. Your favorite invertebrate? Uh, today, <laughs> my favorite invertebrate is a type of sphinx moth called the Turlu Sphinx that's found in Western Mexico and the Southwestern US. Little, it's a small sphinx moth and it's bright green. Really a beautiful creature. Favorite mammal? Kimberly. <laughs> Favorite plant? Favorite plant? Oh. Favorite plant? Um. I would say uh, the giant sequoia, um, partly because it's named for a great Native American scholar, um, sequoia, who invented the uh, entire uh, Cherokee alphabet, uh, partly because it's a huge old growth tree that survives in the Sierras in California. And if we can maintain a world in which there are healthy populations of sequoias, then it will be healthy for other kinds of living things as well. Fantastic. And finally, if you could be anywhere in this world, coronavirus pandemic accept, accepting, where would it be? If you could be somewhere right now, where would it be? Mm. Right now, um, I would want to be um i would want to be back in colombia with you and kimberly and carlos and jose and our other friends um just rewind back to one of those days uh, in february when we were just out there with so much uh, sharing and friendship and brotherhood and and it just enjoying those magnificent tropical birds fantastic um, before we say goodbye, I just want to let you know that uh, the In Conservation with series continues, as Ken said, with uh, Jason Ward tomorrow night, same time. And basically, Jason uh, is a resident of Atlanta. Um, I've seen him being dubbed as the, uh, the US urban birder. He actually is out there sort of trying to engage with not only his community, but with the wider world to get them involved in birds. So we'll be chatting with him, or I'll be chatting with him tomorrow. On Saturday, um, UK time, 4.30 BST, we're talking, well, I'm talking to um, Ruth and Alan. Now, Ruth Miller mm -hmm. and Alan Davis um, originally were the, um, I suppose, the holders of the most amount of birds seen in a year in the world 
and they'll be coming to talk about that as well as all their traveling they're doing now. On Sunday, Drew Lanham takes the stage and Drew, someone that Ken mentioned earlier, an Afro-American who's very much interested, his mission actually, as he says, is, is, is putting color into the conservation conversation. So that's what he's going to be talking about. And next Tuesday, again, sort of UK time, 4.30 in the afternoon for us, um, we're going to be talking with a really good friend of mine, Milan Ruzic, which you may not know his name, but he's one of the most important people in Serbia when it comes to protecting the owls in Serbia. For those who don't know, Serbia, and in particular uh, northern Serbia, has the most amount of long-eared owls on the planet. And in fact, it's the most amount of owls anywhere. You can go to, because um, I go and do tours with him, and one or two people in the audience have actually been with me on these tours. We go to northern Serbia, we go to a place called Kikinda, and that town square, urban area, has been known to have upwards of 800 long-eared owls in the trees. And it's like walking into a Harry Potter set. It's just incredible. So we'll be talking about that and how the owls are protected on Tuesday. So I hope you can join us for that. But anyway, Ken, listen, I really, really, really appreciate you being here today. It's been fantastic chatting with you tonight. I'm, I'm sure that everyone else has agreed with that. And I wish you all the best for the future. I'm looking forward to hanging out with you again. And once things settle down, you and I are going to go on a journey from the Canadian tundra to the uh, Pampas to look for the Eskimo curlew. Sounds excellent. <laughs> excellent. I will look forward to that. Thank you for the great conversation today. Thank you very much. And I, I hope to see everyone again soon. And thanks very much for joining us. Good day and good night. And don't forget, always look up. <laughs>